Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, guys. It's a little bit early, um, but I, I had the time to sign in here, so I thought we might sign in and sort of start discussing things. Um, today, of course, is your review day for the exam, which is Wednesday. So we can work on whatever material you would like to work on, whatever problems, be they from the homework study guide or elsewhere, or any concepts you want to talk about, whatever it is. So I would appreciate it if you guys would start um, typing in the chat any particular problems you want to talk about or voice to me any, any uh, particular concepts you would like to discuss here while I fire up the dot cam. I wonder why are all these X's? This issue with my cloud service apparently. OneDrive needs your attention. There's an issue. What is it? Double click on the back side. Sync issues. Nah, that's good. All right. So let's hit this phone. And we're in business. Okay. So again, this is 11, section four. Today is our exam to review and it is the second. So of course, originally we were gonna have exam two be today, <clears throat> um, but because I had to go to the doctor last Friday, um, I was not able to do our normal review. So anything you guys would like to do. Um, okay, I see in the chat here, we wanna look at six, eight and 11. 6, 8, 11, and 14 on the study guide. Now, any more information you could give me besides I don't understand how to do it uh, would be great. So let's start with number six, and I'd love to hear a bit of a back and forth about what exactly it is that you're finding challenging so we can kind of get to the core of what might be wrong here. Um, pop up the study guide. Okay, on the number six. So logarithmic differentiation is the heart of six. Eight is a linearization problem. 11, we're trying to find where we're increasing, where we're decreasing, local mins, inflection points, intervals of concavity. And 14, trying to find uh, max distance between a line and a parabola. Okay, yeah, so these are very different questions, each of them. Uh, the first problem, number six, we're asked to use logarithmic differentiation. Now, I don't like to do the study guide problems exactly as they are as examples, because remember the point of the study guide is for me to look at your work, um, but I can show you something similar uh, and maybe the general rule, so. This is regarding study guide two, problem six. Logarithmic differentiation. Uh, we've seen that logarithmic differentiation can be useful for a few different things. But in particular, if you want to differentiate a function that looks like Uh, some non-constant function raised to some non-constant power. The trick is to take the natural log on both sides and then use some of the properties of the natural log, namely that this power can come down front so you would get here g of x times the natural log of f of x, which means, and I'll, since you say you figured this out, you're comfy with it, I won't go through and, and finish the problem here, but I will say that from here, now that we have the natural log of capital F is equal to g of x times the natural log of little f. And my goal, remember, is to get capital F primed. If I differentiate on the left and on the right, I will get capital F prime of X over capital F of X. That's the derivative of the natural log of F, right? It's one over the inside 
times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is capital F primed. So it'd be one over capital F times capital F primed, which is capital F primed over capital F. And over here, you would need to apply the, the differential operator DDX. So you'd have DDX of G of X times the natural log of F of X. So you would go ahead and compute this derivative, whatever form that took, and then you'd multiply both sides by capital F and you would be done. Um, if you are certain you don't want to see any more of number six or anything else relating to this, no specific examples, uh, then I can move to number eight. All right, so linearization. Here we want to find the linearization for the square root function at a equals 16. Who remembers what linearizations are? So the linearization is something that we use to find approximate values, right? It can be a useful tool for approximating values of a function. Um, Kyle has the main idea there. The linearization is the tangent line. This is f of a plus f primed of a times x minus a. It's what you get by solving, so for, I'll just say it like this, it's the tangent line. To f of x at x equals a solved for y. The linearization is literally the tangent line. So when I say find the linearization for this function, it's the same thing as saying find the tangent line. Let me show you. Um, I think there's some randomization built in here, yeah. So I'm gonna do this at eight. You guys might have different numbers. If I wanna find the linearization, same thing as finding the tangent line, I need the derivative. That is, I want to take the square root function, which is x to the 1 half, and differentiate it. That's 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1, which is 1 half x to the negative 1 half, or 1 over 2 times the square root of x. So now that I have f primed, I need to figure out f primed of a. I need to figure out the slope. Well, here, a is 8. So this is f primed of 8. So this is 1 over 2 times the square root of 8. Now, 8 is 2 times 4. So this is 1 over 2 times the square root of eight, which itself is two square roots of two, or one over four square roots of two. Also, f of a itself, the y value that I would need to put together my tangent line is f of eight, that's the square root of eight. So with all this stuff, I can write down what the tangent line would be or what the linearization is, however you want to think of it. L of x would be the square root of 8 plus 1 over 4 square roots of 2 times x minus 8, which is the same thing as the tangent line. Just solve for y. Uh, 
right? It's a linear function. The slope comes from the derivative and you go through the point a comma f of a. So Kyle, I wanna be careful with your question. To find the tangent line, you need to plug in the a value. So it's not like plugging in the a value is something you do after finding the tangent line. Um, so the kind of procedure for finding the linearization is take the derivative, plug the a value into the derivative, that will give you your slope. And then if all you have is the x value here, all you have is a, you don't also have f of a, you need to find the output from the original function at a, and then you plug all those things into this formula. So compare the linearization formula, L of X is F of A plus F prime of A times X minus A to the tangent line formula, which is Y minus f of a equals f primed of a times x minus a. If you compare these things, you'll see that they're really the same, right? If you add this f of a over here, you get this thing. All right, this literally is y equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, which is L of x. So the linearization for any function at a point is the tangent line to that function at that point. You just think of that tangent line now as a function in its own right that's useful for approximating the original function f near the base point. I had a quick question um, regarding endpoints. Sure. So if we calculated um, the second derivative um, and then we count uh, or we found the concavity, do we need to find the endpoints really? or the end behavior, I'm sorry, not endpoints. In what setting? What are you trying to do here? What's your goal? So like for one of um, the example or what the problems that you give us, follow the guidelines to graph. For um, sketching the graph. For sketching the graph. Um, technically, we really don't need to find the endpoints if we calculate concavity or is that incorrect? So you're asking if you're trying to draw the graph of f and you know the sign of f double prime, you know whether the function is concave up or concave down, do you still need to know the end behavior for f? Or calculate the end behavior, I guess. I would say yes. Yeah, I mean, you still wanna know like what's the horizontal asymptote if there is one, right? Um, the concavity will not tell you what your horizontal asymptote is. It'll just give you the rough shape of the graph. Could you show um, an example of that? Sure. Like an instance where so I think the end of the questions that was asked earlier here was one of those graphing, was it not? Uh, we eight, eleven, uh, was it increase and decrease, come here, come here down. Fourteen, what was fourteen here? Is this something like this? Oh no, find maximum minimum stuff. Um, Sophia, do you have a, a particular example in mind where you were thinking maybe you could get away without calculating the end behavior or? Well, because technically you could. So end behavior encodes more than concavity, right? I think that's, that's kind of the question. For a polynomial yeah. where you're just either going up or down or something like that, then, then the end behavior is not terribly exciting. Um, still I think useful to have, but for a lot of other functions where you do have a horizontal asymptote, the concavity will not get you that information on its own. Um, but it would be helpful if I had a particular example to work with. Um, I don't have a particular example. I'm just, could I see an example or even just like one where it, it would be incorrect to just go off of the concavity for the end behavior? 
Sure. So let's come here. Let's let's grab an example. Hang on, stop. From section four point five. This is the section on curve sketching. Um, Uh, number nine, we could do number 10. What would be a little more fun here? Yeah, let's do number nine. So this is section 4.5, problem nine. I want to sketch the graph f of x equals x over x minus one. So we begin by finding the domain. Here, this function is happy as long as the denominator is not zero. Uh, so x is not allowed to be one, i.e. the domain. Is negative infinity to one union with one to infinity. Uh, we do have a vertical asymptote here coming from on the bottom is zero. So the VA here is the vertical line, X equals one. Um, the end behavior uh, we calculate limits as X goes to infinity and as X goes to negative infinity. In this case, the limit as X goes to infinity is the limit as X goes to infinity, X over X minus one. If you renormalize dividing top and bottom by X, this is the same as the limit as X goes to infinity, one over one minus one over X. The one over X piece goes to zero as X goes to infinity. So this is one over one minus zero, which is one. And the limit as X goes to negative infinity is the same. Right, you would do the same thing. You would renormalize, and then as x goes to negative infinity, this piece goes to zero. So our end behavior on both sides, we have the horizontal asymptote, y equals one. And I don't think there's any way for us to get that just by thinking about concavity. The concavity will tell us kind of what the shape of the graph is there, but it won't tell us whether we're approaching one or two or one half or seven or something else. Um, other information that we'd like to look at here, maybe are there any symmetries? F of negative X in this case is negative X divided by negative X minus one, which is negative X over negative X minus one like this. Uh, and we can bring a negative out from the top and bottom so I get negative one times X on the top and downstairs negative one times factoring out, I get X plus one, which is negative one over negative one times X over X plus one, uh, which is the negative ones cancel. You just get X over X plus one, but this is neither negative F of X more. What if we wanted to check for symmetry along like a different place, like along a different like axis? Whole different ball like, game. Not necessarily. No, the sort of symmetry like, that I need you guys to be able to check for are the even odd symmetries. So if you are comfortable checking to see whether f of negative x is negative f of x for the odd symmetry, or whether f of negative x is f of x for the even symmetry, then that's good enough for me. Certainly there are lots of other symmetries, really infinitely many other types of symmetry you could consider, um, but I don't require you guys to be comfortable checking those. Um, so here the function is neither even nor odd. But that's a good question. There are lots of other kinds of symmetries and lots of other things you could check for. This function probably does have some kind of symmetry, um, but it's not either of the base. It looks like that. around X equals like, uh, what is it like uh, when the asymptote is? Yeah, there's a symmetry similar to origin symmetry, only in this case about the point one comma zero, but we don't need to know that just 
for, for our purposes yet. We will discover that when we draw the graph. Though. So we've calculated the domain, the vertical asymptotes, the horizontal asymptote, uh, and we've discovered that the thing doesn't have any of the obvious symmetries. Next, we need to look for intercepts, and then we're going to use the first two derivatives to get the shape of the graph. So x intercept. These we solve f of x equals zero. In this case, f of x is x over x minus one. So that whole apparatus is equal to zero, if and only if the top is zero. Uh, so we have an intercept, x intercept zero comma zero. And that's also going to be the y intercept, because we find that by plugging in zero for x. In this case, that would be 0 over 0 minus 1, which is definitely 0 over negative 1, which is 0. So our x and y intercepts are both the point 0, comma 0. All right, not a whole lot of excitement there, but now we go for the shape. Increasing, decreasing. This comes from f primed. So here we need to differentiate the function x over x minus 1. And I think most people, when they look at this, would jump in with the quotient rule. I'm sorry, Andrew, I didn't see that until just now. Did you want me to go back to the previous page for a second? OK. So most of us would jump in here with the quotient rule, which is low d high, so that's x minus 1 times the derivative of the top, which is 1, minus high d low, that's x times the derivative of the bottom, which is also 1, all over low low, the bottom squared. So that's x minus 1 squared. So running this through the quotient rule looks like that. And we get x minus 1 minus x over x squared. Oh, sorry, over x minus 1 squared. The x's cancel, and you get negative 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. Uh, so unfortunately, this thing will never be 0, right? This fraction is never equal to 0 because the top is never 0. Negative 1 is, is not equal to 0 for any values of x. It is undefined when x is equal to 1, but 1 isn't in the domain of the original. so. Let's make note of this. f prime of x equals 0 has no solutions. f prime of x is undefined at x equals 1, but this is not in the domain. So I don't expect there to be a min or a max here because it's not in the domain, but maybe we'll change from increasing to decreasing there or something like that. Uh, we can make our number line for f primed. The only thing that makes sense to put on here is the number one, because that's the only place where this function is zero or undefined. I don't expect it to be a min or a max, but it's nice to know where f is increasing and decreasing. So let's test a point to the left of one and we'll test a point to the right of 1. If I test x equals 0, f primed of 0 is negative 1 over 0 minus 1 squared, which is negative 1. That's definitely negative. And if I test x equals 2, f primed of 2 is negative 1 over 2 minus 1 squared. That's also negative 1. So it looks like my function f is decreasing everywhere to the left of 1 and also decreasing everywhere to the right of 1. So it's always decreasing, except at 1, where it's undefined. To get concavity, I need f double primed. So that's going to be the derivative of negative 1 over x minus 1 squared. It's the derivative of the derivative. And here, if I wanted to, I can actually, instead of using the quotient rule, I can say 
I'm going to differentiate negative one times x minus one to the negative two uh, as a chain and power rule thing. Save myself a little bit of time, why don't we? So if I want to differentiate this, I would bring down the negative two. So my front out here would be negative one times negative two. And then I need to reduce this power by one, leaving the inside alone. So I'd have x minus one to the negative three. Uh, and then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is one. So altogether, f double primed is negative one times negative two, that's positive two times x minus one to the negative three, that's one over x minus one cubed times one. So this is two over quantity x minus one cubed. That is my second derivative. And again, there's nowhere that this thing is equal to zero because the top is never zero, but it is undefined when x is equal to one. So I'll make a number line for f double primed. And I can test something to the left and to the right of positive one. If I test zero, f double primed of zero is two over zero minus one cubed. That's two over negative one cubed. Negative one cubed is negative one. So that's two divided by negative one or negative two. So that's negative. If I test x equals two, f double primed of two is two over two minus one cubed. That's two over positive one cubed, which is just two. This is positive. Okay. So my function f is decreasing everywhere it's defined and then concave down to the left of one, concave up to the right of one. So I put all this together into that picture that tells me the shape. Okay, so the shape of F. Any number from either of the preceding number lines goes here. I know that to the left of one, F primed is negative, so F is decreasing and concave down. I know that everywhere to the right of one, F is decreasing, but now concave up. And I know I have a vertical asymptote here at, at x equals one. If this wasn't a vertical asymptote, if the function wasn't undefined here, what kind of feature would we have just discovered at, at positive one? Decreasing, decreasing. Oh, but concave down, concave up. What does that usually mean? Would that be a max? Not a max. So remember, a max is somewhere where you go from increasing to decreasing. You got to roll over the top of a hill. Uh, Josh got it in the chat. That would be an inflection point, a place where the concavity changes. But this is not an inflection point because we've got a vertical asymptote here. The function is undefined. So everywhere to the left of that BA, we're decreasing concave down. That looks like this. And everywhere to the right of that BA, we're decreasing concave up. That looks like this. Now, I think I get what you're asking, Sophia. The idea being like, oh, well, if I have the shape here, shouldn't that kind of tell me whether we're pointing up or down? Shouldn't that give me the end behavior? And the answer is for a polynomial, sure. But for a more complicated function, even like this rational function, we need to spend a minute investigating the end behavior in order to get the horizontal asymptote. 
So I'll come in and start drawing my graph. I'm gonna mark this as one. I know that my horizontal asymptote is the line y equals one, so I'll draw that in also. Okay, make sure everything's nicely labeled. So here's the VA, x equals one. Here's the HA, y equals one. I know I go through the origin like this, and really that's all I've got so far. Right, for all our work. The only thing I have in addition to this is the shape of the graph. But if we think carefully, that's enough to get us a mighty fine picture because everywhere to the left of one, I know that the shape of the graph has to be like this, right? Decreasing concave down. Since I'm coming through this point and I'm decreasing concave down, there's really only one option. I know I have to approach this asymptote. I know I have to cross here. And that tells me that I have to approach the asymptote on this side like this. So how do I connect those bits decreasing concave down? Like this. And then on the other side of this asymptote, I don't have any x-intercepts. So I can't possibly poke back out like this, then I would have an x-intercept, which means we gotta look like this. And we're decreasing concave up. So this is our graph. And we only have one point labeled explicitly on there. That's not a nice thing. So really we should we should evaluate the function at like at least two other places. F of negative one is negative one over negative one minus one, which is negative one over negative two, which is positive one half. So this is negative one comma one half. And over here at positive two, F of two is two over two minus one, which is two over one. So the y value up here, this is two comma two. But now you really do have a nice graph. Questions on this? And uh, Sophia, did I answer your question about the kind of connection between end behavior and the and uh, concavity? So like concavity told me what this shape would be, but it didn't tell me whether I approached the line y equals one or one half or two. It didn't tell me exactly where that graph sat. So spending a minute investigating the end behavior separately is important. Um, although I agree that for polynomial functions and for functions that do not have a specific finite end behavior, there is some chance that it's redundant. Um, but a priori, we don't, we don't know that. And I, I really feel it's worthwhile on its own. All right, I want to be fair because some questions were asked in particular order, um, and I want to honor the fact that, that those people came prepared. So uh, number 11 from the study guide needs a minute of discussion, and then we're going to move to number 17 from homework nine. So let me come back to the study guide. Here's number 11. Uh, specifically, we wanted to look at the last part, which is finding where the function is concave up and concave down. So I want to spend a, a minute playing around with something similar to the problem in number 11. And then I'll move to Andrew's question from homework nine. So increase, decrease. Okay, and here we'll call f of x, they said x to the 4, let's do x squared log x.
Okay. So we find intervals of increase, decrease, concave up, concave down, any mins, maxes, or inflection points for this very similar function. In fact, with the randomization and web assign, this might be the precise one they're given. I don't know. Intervals of increase and decrease, just like in that previous problem, come from the first derivative. So if I'm looking for increase, decrease, ink, dec, I'll abbreviate them. Then I calculate the derivative. Here, that means using the product rule. So I'll differentiate the x squared to 2x and leave the natural log of x alone. And then I add that to what I get when I leave the x squared alone and differentiate the natural log, which has derivative 1 over x. So this derivative looks like 2x times ln x plus x squared times 1 over x, which is just x. And I can factor an x out, and I get 2 ln x plus 1. So if I want to know my critical numbers, I need to figure out where this derivative can be equal to zero and where it's undefined. Because of the natural log of x, f primed is undefined at zero. But again, that's not in the domain. So strictly speaking, that's not a critical number, but it's still worth keeping in mind. Uh, the other place, f primed is equal to zero well that would be if x is equal to zero or 2 ln x plus 1 is equal to zero this guy again not interesting um, however the second guy this is the same as saying ln x is equal to negative 1 half who can help me solve that equation? Solve for x, this equation. Put it to the power of e. Yeah, we exponentiate, right? So this would be e to the ln x equals e to the negative 1 half. And e to the natural log of x, that's just x. So this is x equals e to the negative 1 half, or 1 over the square root of e. So that's your critical number. It's just one of them. It's this thing. X equals zero, probably worth plotting on our number line, even though it's not in the domain. What is the domain of this function? Just for shits and giggles. Anything above zero? Yeah, strictly above zero, right? Strictly bigger than zero x squared, he's a polynomial. He's happy no matter what you feed him. But the natural log of x, he can only take inputs which are strictly larger than 0. All right. So on the number line I have here for f primed, I'll go ahead and plot 0, even though I'm not really worried about what happens there. And I'll also plot 1 over the square root of e. Sure, yeah, you could leave it as e to the negative one half. That would be fine also. Yeah. I can't test anything to the left of zero because again, this thing is undefined if I try to plug negative numbers in because of the natural log of x. Between zero and one over root e, it's a little tough to, to decide what sort of numbers to use there. Like e is kind of close to three. So this is kind of close to one over the square root of three. Um, if you wanted to be very careful, you could plug like 0 0.01 or something in here. Let's just get a feel for how large 1 over root e is. And of course, were this an exam problem, I would make sure that the numbers are numbers that you are able to work with readily. Looks like this is a little bigger than 1 half. So I could use 1 half as my test point. So if I test x equals positive 1 half, f primed of 1 half, 
is one half times two natural log of one half plus one. Um, now, this piece is certainly positive, but I don't know. I know that the natural log of one half is negative, but I don't know how negative it is. In particular, if I multiply by two, then add one, does that make it positive? Let's see. Two times the natural log of one half plus one. Still negative. Yeah. So this is this is less than zero. That's about negative zero point three nine. Uh, negative zero point three nine. So f primed is negative in here. To the right of this, I can certainly test x equals one. f primed of one is one times two times the natural log of one plus one, which is one times two times zero plus one which is one, this is positive. So my function is undefined everywhere over here. Don't worry about this stuff. Decreasing everywhere between zero and one over the square root of e and increasing everywhere to the right of one over root e. What does that mean I have right here at this x value? Minimum. Good, it's a local min. Might also be an absolute min, right? Because I'm decreasing everywhere to the left and increasing everywhere to the right. Okay, concavity. We need F double primed. To get that, I need to differentiate through this apparatus again. Um, and it's up to you whether you wanna differentiate from here or from here. It really doesn't matter. I'll, I'll take our final form here. So this is the thing that I need to differentiate. It is gonna be a product rule. So I differentiate the X, leaving the other thing alone. You get one times two ln X plus one plus, now I leave the x alone and I differentiate two ln x plus one. Well, the derivative of two ln x is two times one over x and the derivative of one is zero. So f double primed is two ln x plus one plus x times two times one over x. Well, that's just two. Right, because the x and one over x cancel and make one, x times zero is zero. So this is two ln x plus three. Not bad. We have to figure out where he is undefined and where he is equal to zero. So f prime prime of x is equal to zero if and only if. 2ln x plus 3 equals 0. We can subtract the 3, divide by 2, and we find that that's the same as saying ln x equals negative 3 halves, and exponentiating the same way we did earlier, we discover this is the same as saying, saying x equals e to the negative three halves. Uh, and we could write this as one over the square root of e cubed if we wanted. But in any case, uh, that's the only kind of interesting number for us to put on the number line. Zero does make f double primed undefined, but it's not in the domain. And I'll plot e to the negative three halves here.
go ahead and get a decimal for e to the negative three halves so we have some feel for its size. So 0 0.2, so considerably smaller than one over the square root of e. All right. So here's my function, 2lnx plus 3. This is my second derivative. Here's the number line for the second derivative. And here's the only place where that is capable of changing sign. If I test something to the left of this, like 0 0.1, I get 2 times the natural log of 0 0.1 plus 3. Let's just use the calculator here. Sure enough, it's negative. If I test something to the right, like one, we get something positive. Testing x equals one would have been easy, right? Two times the natural log of one, well, the natural log of one is zero. But testing the number in between here, that would have been difficult either way. So if I want to put all of this together into a single number line, Oh wait, no, we don't even need to do this, do we? Yeah, this problem isn't asking for a graph, they're asking for intervals of concave up, concave down, increasing, decreasing. So we're increasing, uh, let's, let's come back here. We're increasing from one over root e to infinity, or from e to the negative one half to infinity. Decreasing, from zero to one over root e, or from zero to e to the negative one half. We're concave up from e to the negative three halves to infinity. And we're concave down from zero to e to the negative three halves. This means we have a local min at x equals e to the negative one half, and the min value would be f of e to the negative one half, which is e to the negative one half squared times the natural log of e to the negative one half. If you square e to the negative one half, you get e to the negative one, and the natural log of e to the negative one half is just negative one half. So this would be negative one over two e. That's your min value. Uh, maxes, there were none of these. Inflection points. Did we have anywhere that the concavity changed? Yeah, e to the negative three halves. And the y value there is f of e to the negative three halves, which would be e to the negative three halves squared times the natural log of e to the negative three halves. If you square e to the negative three halves, you get e to the negative three, and the natural log of e to the negative three halves is just negative three halves. So this would be negative three over two e cubed. So in other words, your IP is the point e to the negative three halves comma 
negative three over two e cubed. So that's all the goodies for now. Uh, I do have to pay attention to the time here. We're doing okay so far. Questions on how we came up with the intervals of increase and decrease, intervals of concave up, concave down, min, maxes, and inflection points for this function. Okay, I think that brings us to Andrew's question then, which is number 17 in homework nine. Let's see here. We're going to make a box with an open top by starting with a square piece of cardboard and cutting a square out from each of the four corners, then bending up the sides. We want to maximize the volume of a box made in this way with this amount of material. All right. So we're starting, this is, Point nine, number 17. We're starting with a three by three square piece of cardboard. And then we're gonna create an open topped box by cutting a few corners out Right, so I throw these away. And then I fold these up. So this gets folded up, this gets folded in, this gets folded in, and this gets folded in, and the result be a box like this, right? Fold up those sides. The question is, can we maximize the area of the box? Or sorry, maximize the volume of the box. I know that the thing we began with is three by three. I need to find some way to get a formula for the volume here. That I can try to maximize. Now let me make sure we're making a da -da 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 -da, box and open top of each of the square piece of cardboard three feet wide by cutting a square from each of the four corners, depending on the size. All right. General situation let x denote the length of the side square being cut out and let y denote the length of the base. Okay. So here's the piece of the cardboard that is going to become the base. Can everybody see that? When you fold in those flaps, when you fold this flap in, this flap in, this flap in, this flap in, it's like we're looking straight down from above, this is the base. 
So they've asked me to call this y. And it's with the understanding that all these are the same size. So this, the length of the square corner that we're cutting out, they've said, call that x. So this is x. And these are square pieces. So this is x. This guy would be x by x. This is x by x. This is x by x. And the base here, they've asked me to call this y. And that is y. And of course, this is also y. Because everything here is supposed to be square. So who can help me out with this dimension? The height of the resulting box. Is that x, y, something else? What is it? What is this dimension of the resulted bo resulting box? Is this x? Good. It's x, right? Because the length here that I have to fold up is the same as the size that I've cut out of the corner here. So this is x. Good. All right. And what about this down here? Why? Yeah, that's why. And this guy over here? Why? Also why. So my volume is y squared times x, right? height times width times depth, whatever. I also need to use this information somehow. What can you tell me about how X and Y are related? X plus Y equals three. Almost. 2x plus y equals 3. Yeah, good. So if you look along one of these lengths, here I've got an x length, a y length, and an x length. So 2x plus y has to be equal to 3. And by the symmetry, you could have done it either way. So This is the thing I'm trying to maximize. This is my constraint. I want to maximize this subject to this constraint. So I solve this guy for one of my variables. Most convenient here to solve for y. So the volume, if I write it just as a function of x, is 3 minus 2x all squared times x. Uh, we can multiply that out. 3 minus 2x all squared, that's 9 minus 6x minus 6x is minus 12x uh, plus 4x squared all times x. So v of x, finally, that's, um, I'll write it with the largest power first. That would be uh, 4x cubed minus 12x squared plus 9x. Okay. Uh, and now my goal here is to um, maximize this function. So I'll take the derivative. v primed, 4x cubed, that's going to become 12x squared minus 12x squared, that's going to become 24x plus 9 is my derivative. I can factor a 3 out, and that gives me 4x squared minus 8x plus 3. 
Uh, and now I want to try to factor the resulting quadratic here. So I would need two numbers whose product is 12 and whose sum is negative eight. Uh, is that negative six and negative two, I think? So you can factor this like four X squared um, minus six X minus two X plus three. I think that's going to be the trick. And then you factor by grouping. From these two, I can pull out a 2x. And what's left there, if you pull out a 2x, uh, this would be 2x minus 3. And from this pair, I can pull out a negative 1. And you get 2x minus 3. So altogether here, I'll have three times two X minus one times two X minus three, or just three, two X minus one, two X minus three. So interestingly here, I have two critical numbers, one half and three halves. When I set this factor to zero, I get x equals one half. When I set this factor to zero, I get x equals three halves. And remember my goal here is to find a max. So the next thing I'm gonna do is make a number line for v. I'm sorry, make a number line for v primed and plot on it those two numbers. So here we go. Put one half here, put three halves here. They're both coming from multiplicity one factors. Uh, so I know that V prime will change sign every time I jump over one of these guys. To the left of one half, I could test the zero. V primed of zero is definitely positive. It's positive nine. I could test one in between them, or I could use the multiplicity trick just for fun. If you test one, you get 12 minus 24 is negative 12 plus nine is negative three. So we are indeed negative here. And to the right of three halves, we could test two, or again, use the multiplicity trick to deduce that V prime will be positive there. So that means V, the volume is increasing then decreasing, then increasing. So this guy right here is a local max. This guy right here is a local min. Now you do have to ask yourself, what is a reasonable range and domain for X and Y here? What, what is a reasonable set of X and Y values? Uh, if X is three halves, then Y is three minus two times three halves. The twos cancel, you get three minus three, which is zero. In other words, if I tried to let X be three halves, that's, that means I'm taking up this whole thing. Let me try to illustrate the X equals three halves case here. Uh, x equals three halves would be cutting out all of this for one corner, which means I'd be cutting out all of this for the other corner, which means I'd be cutting out all of this for the other corner and all of this for my last corner. You see, if I use x equals three halves, I actually end up with a volume of zero. Um, so the only thing which makes sense, and it's borne out by our first derivative test here, is the x equals one half, right? x equals one half is our 
maximum, which means y should be 3 minus 2 times 1 half, which is 3 minus 1, which is 2. And our max volume is y squared times x, which is 2 squared times 1 half, which is 4 times 1 half, which is 2. Uh, and the units here, of course, are feet cubed or cubic feet. So the dimensions that maximize the volume in this situation are a height of one half and a square base of side length two. And the volume that is attained using those dimensions to maximize volume is two cubic feet. The situation here where you're starting with a square piece and cutting corners out is a kind of interesting way to construct a box. Um, so maybe the challenge here is just getting started, right? You have to draw that picture and kind of understand the folding that's going on. But from there, it feels like any of these other optimization problems where you isolate one of the variables to get your, uh, the function you're trying to maximize or minimize into a function of a single variable take derivatives, find critical numbers, and then um, identify your max or your min, whatever it is you're looking for. Questions on this one? There will be at least one applied optimization problem on this test. Right? There will be at least one curve sketching problem on this test. So there's some things you can be certain to encounter here. And this is one of them. Maybe not this exact optimization problem, but, but something like this. What else would we like to see? We've got about 10 more minutes left in class here. Is there anything else you guys would like to see from the study guide or from the homework? We're all very quiet. I do think there was a problem that last Friday we were working on when we ran out of time. And the goal was to find the point on the parabola, something or other, that is closest to some or other point. Let me return to that one and show you kind of the nice way to solve that. Oh, wait, uh, let's see. We just got a request for number 14 from the study guide. So we can do that instead. That's fine. I'd rather do what you guys want to do. Not homework time, study guide. This is similar. Find the maximum vertical distance between this line and this parabola, where x is between negative 2 and 3. Okay, so we want to find the maximum vertical distance between y equals x plus 6 and y equals x squared. Think of these as graphs. And we're restricting our attention to the closed interval from negative 2 to positive 3. Okay, well, here's y equals x squared. I'll put negative two here, positive three here. We know the y value up here is nine. The y value here is four. 
And then if I graph the function y equals x plus six, okay, well, six is somewhere right in between here. If I plug in x equals three here, this is also nine. And if I plug in x equals negative two here, this is also four. So that line is the line that connects these guys, oh, big fat points here together. Oof, my art, all right. Okay. So here's the deal. You pick your favorite X value, any X value in here, and you can find the vertical distance between the point on that line and the point on the parabola. And as you move X from left to right through here, that vertical distance changes. Like if you're all the way at three, the vertical distance is, is zero. And if you're just barely to the left of three, then that vertical distance is very small. If you're here at zero, then the vertical distance is six because the, the parabola right here goes through the origin, but the y-intercept for the line is six. And the kind of question is, is there somewhere in between here where the vertical distance is bigger than six? It looks like there is, doesn't it? Looks like right here, that vertical distance is a little larger than it is here. And the question is, can you come up with a formula for this distance? Well, an arbitrary point on the parabola is of the form x comma x squared. because that parabola is the parabola y equals x squared. And an arbitrary point on the line is of the form x comma x plus six. So the distance, the vertical distance between those two points, good, is x plus six minus x squared. We're just subtracting the y values to find the vertical distance. So this would be the function negative x squared plus x plus six, if you want to write it in standard form, which means that d primed, I want to now maximize this thing. So I'd calculate its derivative. d primed would be negative two x plus one the six differentiates to zero. So d primed is equal to zero if and only if negative two x plus one is equal to zero, if and only if one equals two x, which means x has to be one half. So we suspect that one half is the golden boy that like right here, I've got a maximal distance. Squared. Uh, say that last part again, what was squared? I'm sorry. Uh, isn't D squared in the beginning? No, I'm not using the distance formula here. Um, so I'm just subtracting the y values. If you wanted to use the distance formula, this would be d squared equals all this minus zero squared. Um, but here I'm, I'm just taking this y value and subtracting this y value from it. So don't, don't confuse this with the distance formula. Although you could use the distance formula, I guess, if you wanted to, right? You could start with d squared equals x minus x squared plus x plus six minus x squared squared, which would be the same as saying d squared equals zero squared plus x plus six minus x squared squared. And then you could deduce that d is x plus six minus x squared by taking square roots, but you don't need to. 
I, I would encourage you not to necessarily invoke the distance formula unless you need to here. Uh, you can see that the distance is a straight vertical distance. So you just subtract the y values. There's no need to use that whole distance formula thing. Did I, are, are we comfy with that response? Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Cool, okay, good, good, good. So then I suspect one half is the sweet spot, but we should check by making a number line. If I plug in something to the left of one half here, like zero, I get one. If I plug in something to the right of one half, like one, I get negative two plus one is negative one. So yeah, we are increasing everywhere to the left of one half, decreasing everywhere to the right of one half, uh, which means certainly x equals one half is the absolute max. Therefore, uh, the distance is maximized when x is equal to one half, and the max distance is we would plug it back in here. Um, be one half plus six minus one half squared, which is uh, six as a ratio over two is 12, 13 sixths plus, uh, sorry, minus one fourth. So I'm not too concerned about what this is. I guess if you wanted to, you could have a common denominator here uh, as a ratio over four. I could multiply this by two. Hmm. We can leave it like this, it's fine. 13, six minus one fourth. Um, we have two minutes left for any last concerns or questions. These are being subtracted there. Any last problems we would like to talk about or ask about at all before we sign out for the day. Remember your exam is Wednesday. That's this next class meeting. We do have office hours today, right? Yep, today and tomorrow. Normal office hours all week this week, yep. All right. Anything else, gang? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and sign out. Remember, the sooner you can get your study guide in, the sooner I can try to turn them around and get you some feedback. I am doing my best to get through those, although I have two other classes this week that have tests. Um, but if you get bits of your study guide turned in, or if you just wanna ask questions about any portion of it, you can always email a Canvas message or come to office hours. Um, that is it, I hope you guys are preparing hard. And as you run into questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I've gotten a lot of emails talking about different things going on in folks' lives, um, but not a lot of emails with specific questions about problems. So make sure you're spending time solving problems. And as you run into issues there, make sure you're talking to someone about them. Uh, it doesn't have to be me, it could be a tutor, it could be someone else, but make sure you spend enough time solving problems to prepare for this test. All right, take care guys. <laughs>